All right, looks like we're ready to get going. Um, first off, thanks uh, for joining us today uh, for the 2021 summer meeting uh, for the Metro chapter. My name is Cameron Carr and I'm your chapter president. Thanks for spending the next hour with us and getting caught up on everything there is to do with the Metro chapter. Um, let's first start off by taking care of a couple um, housekeeping items. For old business and new business, please use the, the raise your hand function and we'll try to get a call on you or you can use the comments section and we'll address uh, all, the, all the questions at the end of the uh, presentation today. Uh, second thing here is uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the spring meeting on April 19th, 2021. If I can get someone to raise their hand for a first. And uh, a second. Okay, thank you. The minutes have been approved. Next up is the president's report. I'm gonna be brief uh, today on, on my report to give some extra time to our guest speaker, um, Craig. So real quick, um, if you can go to the next slide, Bryce. I always like to make sure that everyone knows my contact information up on the screen here, my email and, and uh, phone number. If you have any comments or suggestions, questions, or even complaints, make sure and reach out to me so I can help address the issue or, or get some answers back to you. Um, something that's happening with the Metro Board is we've decided to take part in the Clubs for Youth program. So we're working with Matt Gilson uh, at the section office uh, to donate five sets to Montebello and Artesia High Schools. And something that happened, I think this last year is uh, an instruction piece with it. So there'll be some group instruction with that. So it's very cool, excited to be a part of that again. Also um, looking ahead to later this year, we will have two open positions on the board. So I just wanted to make that, uh, put that out there to everybody that if there's anyone interested in running for a director's position uh, for the board, please reach out to me or anyone on our board and uh, we'll get you on the, on the ballot for the election for uh, on our annual meeting. And that's, that actually concludes my report. Next up, uh, I'd like to welcome Hida Yoshinaga to give our vice president's report. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, am I on there? Yep, you're good. Okay. All right. Well, uh, hello, everybody. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, for the uh, vice president report, um, let's see, the section and the chapters did change the accounting system. So the format looks a little bit different, uh, but the uh, general fund is looking uh, very good at 29895 And Bryce, you can go to the next page. In the tournament of uh, financials, we have uh, $5,157 in net assets. So uh, we are in good shape and uh, looks, looks good going into next year as well. Thank you. Great, thanks Hide for that. Um, next up, we have our secretary's report and I'd like to welcome on Rick Steele. Thank you, Cameron. Hello everybody. Um, real quick, as you can see, our total roster is 520. We have uh, 443 chapter members, uh, 74 chapter associates, 61 life members, five life member centuries, seven retired, and 12 uh, reserve members unemployed, and three suspended at this time. Um, so everything's still holding pretty much the same as from the last time and looking okay. Great, you. thanks, Rick. Appreciate that. Um, next on the agenda is our guest speaker. Um, this, uh, I thought that this might be a, a really good topic for everyone in our in our chapter to uh, to listen to, hear about, learn some stuff, maybe get some suggestions. 
Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome on um, the Director of Governmental Affairs for the SCGA, Craig Kessler. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks to the Metro chapter for inviting me to share a few uh, comments with you today. I hope it's informational. And if there's time, I'd be happy to answer some questions and I'll give you my email address. I'm always available. And I can recognize a few names who have called me and emailed me and asked about various subject. I had subjects. I am gonna talk about drought as a secondary topic. I'm gonna to talk primarily first about the 2021 uh, legislative session in the state of California. But before I do, I thought it important to just share a few comments uh, from my experiences about COVID. I know everyone reads the papers, listens to the news, and knows that the Delta variant is, uh, is with us. It's causing us a little consternation and some problems um, based upon unless my one proviso to this comment would be if a variant pops up that is resistant to the various vaccines that handle both the primary, the first variant of COVID and the Delta variant, um, then I think that outdoor golf, as we've always known it, with rakes and ball washers and the whole nine yards, is on solid ground moving forward. There have been some changes in a number of counties, I believe in Southern California, the only one is Los Angeles, but a number of Bay Area counties in the last 48 hours have adopted face covering requirements indoors. That would mean golf shops, um, halfway houses, I suppose, banquet rooms, coffee shops, and to the degree to which I think everyone was looking forward to getting back to that aspect of the business, that may be on, uh, maybe on a little bit of suspension or a little bit of problem for a period of time. The SARS or COVID um, virus is, has a, is not an influenza virus, but it has a lot in common. It's never going away. And just as we get flu vaccines every year, and I don't know about the rest of you, but I've had the flu a few times when taking that vaccine. And it's always an extremely mild version of it. You almost don't know you have the flu. You think you simply have a serious head cold. My suggestion is at that point, if we ever get to that point, of being sufficiently um, vaccinated and otherwise immune to COVID, um, uh, then I, I think uh, with that, that's gonna be the nature. And I don't think that, that should cause us to panic or to consider that we're locking down or going back. And at no time, if you take a close look at the hospitalizations and the death rates, and that's a bit of a macabre subject to discuss, they're quite a bit out of sync to the um, infection rate and particularly the infection rate of those like yours truly here, who's uh, twice vaccinated. Um, oftentimes the most insidious thing about it is you have no clue that you, were, that you were reinfected because you're asymptomatic or the symptoms were so mild, you just thought you were a little under the weather that day. So I, I, I wanna just open up by indicating that again, I had the joy, the great joy of dealing with 10 different public health departments for a period of about 15 or 16 months and including the one in Los Angeles County, which, wow, well, that one wasn't a joy. That one was a miserable experience, but most of them were pretty good to work with. And I just don't think that the, the outdoor game, and, and the, as we know it, is in jeopardy moving forward. Again, with the great caveat that if there is a strain that's, uh, that's resistant to these vaccine, then all bets are off. Um, but again, just I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a doctor, but based upon what I've read, the credible things I've read from credible sources, that's a very unlikely event, uh, but it is indeed uh, possible. Moving on to the uh, 2021 legislative session. And I'll be fairly brief. And actually I'm gonna discuss one item because this is an audience of golf professionals uh, that's really from the previous two legislative sessions, and we didn't get around to it this year, and that's Assembly Bill 2257. I know got PGA professionals are interested, so I will close with that as one of three bills that I will talk about that we dealt with in this year. 672, and thank you to any and all who responded to the big dragnet that we put out 
uh, to contact state senators and members of the assembly uh, with concerns about it. I, I'm not given to exaggeration or hyperbole. In fact, quite the opposite. I usually downplay things because I know how rumors abound and I don't want people to overreact. But when I wrote at the beginning of this year that Assembly Bill 672 was the potentially the most harmful uh, bill uh, for the golf industry filed in, in my memory or my lifetime, I genuinely meant it. And to refresh everyone's memory, it would have, it would have taken 22% of the golf courses in the state, that's the 22% owned by governments, municipal facilities, and removed all of them from the protections of the Park Preservation Act, from the California Environmental Quality Act, and from local zoning protections. So that in essence, uh, chopping them up for affordable housing would not be subject to the uh, zoning uh, prerogatives of local city councils and uh, county halls of administration. It would be bypassed. In other words, they'd be preempted uh, by a state decision that you could move very quickly. Uh, that would have, uh, in essence, and, and, the, and the primary objection to that is that it would have taken golf courses and only golf courses, municipal golf courses, out so that all other pieces of public property would still be hands off in terms of, and this bill was gonna chop it into affordable housing. And so it would put a target on the back of every golf course and almost serve them up because virtually every city and county in California is not meeting the requirements put on by the state uh, to meet, uh, to do certain housing construction, particularly affordable housing construction. So that would have, uh, would have taken that stock of our golf courses, which are where we did some research at the SCGA, over 90% of the developmental programs like Youth on Course, SCGA Junior, First Tee, PGA Junior League, those things happen on, on that particular class of golf course. That's the growth of the game programs. That's where most persons are introduced to the game. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I always do when given the option to sit with a lot of uh, private club boards of directors and green committees, and I always ask them, how, what was their journey to get to this spot? Well over half of them uh, indicate that their journey began at a municipal facility. It, they're not to the country club born. So that's an integral part of the entire ecosystem. We lose that. We lose our, all of our capacity for growth. And quite honestly, whatever, we may have a thousand golf courses in the state of California now, uh, but we shorter, we'd be down to four or 500. And for those of you on this call who work in the industry, that's not a happy career prospect for anyone. It doesn't matter what your role is, whether you're a professional, a superintendent, uh, a vendor, a supplier, an owner, it really matters. It doesn't matter what level you are. Uh, growth is the key to success in, in, in particularly anything. So I'm happy to report that, well, I, the bill was a piece of legislative overreach to the nth degree. So it was clumsy. It was a legislator making her mark to make, to make, to make clear in no uncertain terms that she felt that golf courses were totally useless, uh, unproductive use of land, at least in her district. In fact, she did say that, and she's aiming at them. Well, the bill never made it to its first committee of reference uh, to the degree to which uh, the golf community stepped up and fought that bill at the grassroots level. I, I think we should congratulate ourselves for, in essence, giving a bill the worst fate any bill filed can have is to not even get scheduled on its first committee of reference. However, having said that, do understand that the anti-golf animus in combination with a, with a growing uh, housing uh, need um, is something that will continue to haunt us. Maybe not necessarily in, in this particular iteration, something that's, that amounts to such a great overreach, but certainly it's in keeping with that theme that, that I constantly put out, and we will get to it when we get to the yeah, houses, yeah. because they're really one and the same. And whoever's talking, I'd appreciate if you kind of mute yourself so it's not completely disconnected. Yeah, starting at 11 o'clock. Yeah, whoever's starting at 11 o'clock is the one who might consider muting themselves. <laughs> so, uh, so, so moving on, and, and, that, and that is this, there's a perception of us in the golf industry, simply, that we put too few persons on too much land 
that's in too much competition from recreational and other very valuable societal interests like housing. And the too few that we put on that land are those who receive too much from society already. In other words, the elite. Now I know in what I just explained is, is a caricature. It's not true. However, the degree to which many think it's true, and certainly assembly member Christina Garcia thinks it's true and she's not alone. We have to constantly understand that, appreciate they have that point of view and constantly tell the truth about, our, about who we are and what we are and our story uh, to anyone and everyone who will listen. But beyond the confines of conversations like this and tell that to media, tell it to the outside world and you, as the primary ambassadors of the game, I mean, keep in mind that golfers themselves, uh, when, they, when they go to a golf course, um, their point of reference, and, their, and sometimes their exclusive point of reference is a golf professional. It's not, it's not the GM usually, it's not the banquet manager, it's not the superintendent, it's not the maintenance staff, it's, it's not the PGA section staff, and it certainly, it certainly isn't me, as many calls as I get, it's you. And so, the degree to which you're good ambassadors of the positive messages about our game, not just its social utility and the demographics that actually play it, which is, a, again, is very different from the character I just explained, which is often the perception of us, but also in terms of our good, of our solid use of water and our continuing declining use of water, pesticides and other inputs and so forth. So do keep that very much in mind and that's where it dovetails that the anti-golf animus evidenced by 672 is going to come back in various different forms with each legislative session. Uh, the bills may not be as damaging as that, but they're all of the same character. And so be aware of it. And I think a part of the, whether it's the SCGA, the SCPGA, or the, or the Greater California Alliance for Golf we're part of, we're aware that that's our, our challenge moving forward. Very briefly, the one other piece of legislation we continue to deal with its number is AB 1346 for people who are gluttons for that particular kind of punishment, as I am, uh, that it is, is a bill that directs our Air Resources Board to develop, to go through the rulemaking process to, to ban the sale of gas powered engines 25 miles, excuse me, you know, 25 horsepower or below. The golf, now you, what they're aiming at are the blowers and the small equipment, much of it is domestic equipment but included in the category are, is a lot of machinery that golf courses use. And the truth is those things are either not available in battery powered and electric power, or they're available, but it, they don't really work as intended for use. Um, so the good news here is that we were able to secure a meeting with the author of the bill and that legislation is moving, it's moving through both houses and it will be signed for the governor, that's inevitable but it is directing the Air Resources Board to consider feasibility and cost. By feasibility, it means some flexibility that the degree to which that stuff is just not available for purchase on the market, those dates would be later than, rather than some of the sooner dates that might be applicable to simple domestic or gardening uh, gas powered uh, equipment. In addition, when we, with, with financial uh, features being part of it, that means perhaps some rebates to stimulate the purchase or the transfer or tax credits or something like that. We've already, the industry's already submitted comments to the Air Resources Board that have been well received. We're on our way. And I think this is a good example of what, unlike 672, which was a declaration of war against the golf industry, there's no response to that except belligerent opposition. But most of the things we do are not that at all, contrary to some of our counterparts in other states. It's usually recognizing that if the world is going in the direction of phasing out gas powered engines in favor of electric power, we're better off riding that wave and in that, instead of bucking that wave. And if we can ride it to shore, we have the capacity to fashion it to our benefit. That's been sort of the central organizing principle of most of the things that we've done in a decade or more with various water districts and water providers. And I would argue it's one of the reasons that we're treated much better than most industries when it comes down to, to drought. Final thing I'll deal with, which is not a bill of uh, 2021. We wanted to make it a bill of 2021, but 
There's only so much bandwidth in the legislature and this one just didn't make it. And that's Assembly Bill 2257, which is the successor bill to Assembly Bill 5, which dealt with the whole idea of who's an independent contractor and who's an employee. Remind everybody that this whole, not this whole miserable business started when the California Supreme Court issued a decision in 20, 28, 2017 that overturned established law on that point coming out of a 1989 California Supreme Court decision. And they overturned it by simplifying it into a three prong test. The problem was the second prong made everyone, made every, it was impossible to be an independent contractor. Read literally, uh, surgeons would, would have had to be employees of hospitals in order to get surgical privileges, radiologists, it, it became a joke. And that's why the legislature had to take it up and admittedly bollocks the job with AB5, made it quite a bit better with AB2257. We had hoped to improve it a little bit more in 2021, but with COVID, budget issues, and various other things, it just didn't hit the bandwidth. But I wanna point out to everyone on this call because there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding. There is an exception that we worked from the very beginning of the AB5 uh, controversy right with the, the author of the bill, Lorena Gonzalez, who, have, who doesn't, have, doesn't have horns, doesn't have it in for the golf industry, is quite easy to work with. And we worked with her office, not just one year, but two years uh, to get a business to business professional exception into that legislation, which doesn't specifically cover PGA golf professionals because you are not licensed by the state and thus not defined within the labor and the employment codes. And by the way, I doubt that you would want that because then you would be regulated by the state, you'd be licensed. And while the fee may start out reasonable, just ask anyone who pays license fees, it's just another way for the state to get tax money. And then you have an entirely non-governmental structure of managing your profession, which is, uh, which is, which manages your profession. The profession is managed by people who understand the profession and in fact, that's the PGA of America through all of its institutions. So I don't think you'd want to jettison that just to be, have a slightly easier route towards independent contracting. But that business to business for professional exception and it, for professional services exception establishes a 12 prong test. PGA professionals under 11 of those 12 prongs can easily work, they can work as employees, they can also work as independent contractors. And most management groups, most ownership groups have figured that out in conjunction with their own council and have drafted those agreements that cover it. The 12th one is not so much a contradiction of that as it is so it's worded in such a way, I, I can't tell you what it means. And so whenever there's some ambiguity, we had hoped to stamp out that, to eliminate that ambiguity in this session. That was one of our overarching goals before 672 and the world fell in, it fell in, in other respects. And that'll be a goal going into 2022 uh, for the California golf industry. Um, so rest assured. But PGA professionals, youth sports coaches, which is very important. I'm gonna, I know it's important to the SCGA because that we're dependent upon youth sports coaches for SCGA Junior Golf Foundation. I'm going to guess that Junior League and various, uh, various programs of the PGA fall under that. And so does the first tee. And they can work as independent contractors. And there's even a route for caddies. It's a circuitous route, but the fact that there's a route at all, I find somewhat miraculous in the sense that the legislature made a bit of a fool out of me because I told everyone we didn't have a chance in hell of getting that through and we got it through. But whether that's dumb luck or we're smarter than we think, I have no idea, but uh, we'll, we'll take it and uh, we will run with it. Moving on to what it actually says on here, a longer term strategy, a must, and that sounds like a piece I just wrote or the title of it. I think if you read newspapers, you'll know that the Los Angeles Times in particular, uh, it was a joke I told somebody the other day, was thank God for the Delta variant, at least it knocked drought, fire, climate change, and pending disaster off the front page of the paper for a day or two. But it's back there again today in the form of, the, uh, in the form of Arizona, which is in worse shape than we are. I can't emphasize enough that you know that's clamping down on us it, uh, in the northern part of the state, it's already there. I mean, I was on the phone last week with the, with the head of uh, Sonoma County Water, 
And Sonoma was the first county declared in an emergency situation. It, it, it's, it's a source of a lot of fires. It's a total disaster and they're in deep trouble, but following closely are Marin, Santa Clara. So you can see it's moving from north to south. It will hit us next year unless we get incredibly lucky with snow and rain this, this season. And the reason that we're a little bit delayed is that having never been able to rely upon mother nature uh, for, our, for our water needs, we have massive storage mechanisms and that storage is pretty solid in the southern part of the state. In the northern part of the state, the biggest earthen dam they have, and it's, I think, believe it's the biggest in the state, Lake Oroville, is literally perhaps weeks away from being unable to generate electricity because there's not sufficient water in it. When I say it's, it's worse than you think, because the numbers are shaping up like 2014, 2015, 2016 in terms of raw precipitation, but in those five intervening years, it has gotten sufficiently hotter and drier in the aggregate in, in the climate that there that while the same precipitation produces more rain than it does snow. Snow is the way we store water and transmit it down to the southern part of the state. That's our conveyance mechanism. We haven't invested sufficiently in some of the cutting edge mechanisms like stormwater capture or aquifer recharge, or in the case of San Diego County in particular, desalination. Those things are coming, but as with all things that are coming, they're expensive and they haven't come yet. So in the short run, we can't really rely upon them. But the less snow falls, and then the actual, all the predictive models that climatologists have used to say that we'll get so much water runoff from so much snowpack are proving to be inadequate. We get much less water as a result of even much less snow. You put that together with the wildfires, with the hotter conditions, the drier conditions, and the lower precipitation, and we're in a vice. I mention this because you should begin thinking about it. You should begin. You should know um, that when this happens, golf golf is a frivolous use of water. It says so in the California Constitution. It, it's 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 totally discretionary. It can be jettisoned at any time. We may think it's important, and yes, it employs people and it produces taxes and all the rest of that, but so do other things. And, and human health, human health consumption, and, and agriculture are the uh, much more important uses. So keep that in mind, and we're sore thumbs. You know, there, there are industri industries that use massive amounts of water more than golf, but you don't drive by those industries and see 120 acres of lush green as you drive by. So we are a target in that regard as well. So getting back to that meme I discussed in sort of our municipal challenge that are literally our, our credibility for encumbering that much land in urban areas, you add to that factor that we put a lot of water on that land or seeming or in the public's mind, we put a lot of water. And even though we're putting less and less and less of it with each passing year, and investing in different kinds, in warm season grasses, irrigation efficiency, all those kinds of things. And I think it's a great record and I think you should shout it from every mountaintop because it may change the opinions, some general public opinion of us as the drought deepens. At the, at the end of the day, we still are, use, we are massive users of water and that's gonna become problematic. And that plays in to that meme I discussed about putting too few persons on too much acreage that, that, that takes too much water and, and the too few that are enjoying it are part of the elite so-called. Again, much of this is not true, but that becomes rampant. Good news here is that the golf industry has invested a lot of time, a lot of effort, and just a lot in, in, develop, in getting what we actually do in front of those policymakers on the front line in public utilities, and in water districts, and even at some level, level at the political level. They respect us, they understand us, even they tout us often as the most efficient of all the outdoor irrigation industries. Having said that, when the 92% of the population that doesn't play golf is being told they can't water their lawn but one or two days per week, and they have to cut back, and they're going into a second or third tier of pricing and paying a higher bill, and they're being told to conserve constantly and being cut, 
when they drive, they're, they're not going to be sympathetic to all the wonderful things we've done over the years to cut our water usage and that we plan to do in the out years. And public opinion ultimately affects outcomes. And, and I've seen this up front where the scientists, the engineers and, you know, in a public utility will have one opinion on golf and continue to serve us. And they'll eventually come to us and say, sorry, this is all about the politics now and the perceptions. And we've been directed to clamp down on you. We have no choice in the matter. We know we don't agree with it. So I want everyone to sort of keep that in mind. We have a confluence of issues and problems. And, uh, and as Tom Addis, if he's still on this call knows, and I think he shares with me, um, as much as we have become much more engaged in the last decade, whether it's uh, whether the SCGA and the SCPGA have certainly become more engaged, but, but at a statewide level in the California Alliance for Golf, uh, I don't think it's adequate to the real challenges and the tasks that, that we have uh, moving at hand. And um, it's a, when times get a little tight, what we tend to do is react. And notice that even um, having in recent days, I'm not gonna go into details, this is not the desert section, uh, but we're starting to see as the newest uh, iteration of the Coachella Valley Water Management Plan comes out, the last iteration just before 2010 caused us untoward grief with the media as well. This plan, we had a heavy hand in helping to write it. It works for the golf industry. It's based upon sound presumptions Sound, sound projections and reasonable expectations. So the point is that you can't simply react at the back end. That's the result of seven or eight years of consistent work uh, with the water district and the community coming together in a formal actual golf, com actually commission to the Coachella Valley Water District. That's the common denominator of every one of these efforts in the longer run. So I guess that's my plea at the end of this. Um, drought longer term strategy a must. Uh, the strategy is less the specifics than it is the general perceptions. So if you manage a golf course or have any say in it and so forth, use a little common sense and brown out those edges where people can see when they're driving by. Trust me, that makes a difference. Um, it may not, in reality, we can tell ourselves and we can tell the world that we use less than three fourths of 1% of the potable water consumed in the state. 40% of our facilities are on recycled water, uh, that, we had, that our water footprint is a fraction of what it was just 20 years ago, and that we're exploring on-site recycling, all, all kinds of cutting edge things that cost this industry a lot of money and has put it in some difficulty. You can say those things till we're blue in the face, and I encourage us to do it, but when, it, when times get tough and, and we're in a drought, we're not gonna get a lot of sympathy on that. So keep those optics in mind and keep the fact that, the, that, it, that in, in something like this, facts are, facts are great, but perceptions, my experience has been is that perceptions always matter more than facts when you're talking about something ultimately that comes down to political decisions and who gets the water when, where, and how always comes down to political decisions. And I think it's one of the reasons that during the 2016 drought, and I can say this because this is a this is not there's no one from the media on this particular call, but oftentimes in private sessions we got a lot of, we got away with murder. Uh, we did so, we were given so much slack by so many water districts in southern part of the state. Northern part of the state it was a little different. Contra Costa County, which is very heavily laden with golf courses, uh, they were cut back 40 percent, even though that that district was under a 20 percent conservation mandate by the state. Down here where oftentimes, oh, I don't know, Los Angeles, where, which was a 16 and later 12, they didn't ask us to conserve one, one drop over what we were doing before. And that's because we went to them many years prior and worked with them on some longer term plans to put the, put the industry on a, on, a, on a water reduction diet. And they were content with us and they focused their attention the, the, on the low hanging fruit of other industries that didn't do that. So with that, um, I uh, don't have slides for you today, and it was a little bit uh, extemporaneous and a little bit all over the map. I hope you can draw a little bit of uh, coherence out of it and some specifics. And um, so I will, uh, again, thank you for inviting me to uh, prattle on.
And, um, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If there's sufficient time, I don't want to get in the way of the rest of the meeting. I'm easily accessible. If you go to the SCGA website, there's a government affairs hub. I think my email address is probably on the SCPGA site. And it's very simple to remember. It's my first initial of my name, C for Craig Kessler at scga.org. And I think for a few of you who are actually on this call who have contacted me in the past, I'm, I'm very, very accessible um, and would love to talk to you about any and any and all issues. So again, thanks Cameron for inviting me and um, I hope I shed more light than I did just simply a lot of words and a lot of heat on subjects. And if I scared you a little bit, good because we should be a little bit scared right now. Agreed. Thank you so much, Craig. What a wealth of knowledge and uh, a huge advocate for the game of golf. Craig Kessler, thanks so much for your time. All right, uh, let's jump into some committee reports. We're going to start with tournaments. And uh, actually, our co-chair, James Schacht, is going to jump on to give us a quick update on some upcoming events. James? Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. It's good to see at least a couple of you on screen. Uh, let's get it kicked off with our match play events. We have both the individual and the four bell uh, year long events going on. I hope that they do stick to this year. I know Max and uh, the rest of the board is making sure that everyone is finishing their matches on time. So if you still have a match to play, please try to meet those deadlines. Um, they are firm ish deadlines, but please, uh, please pay attention to those. So our other events we have uh, coming up August 9th is the Pro Pro Scramble. Thanks to Anaheim Hills for hosting that. If you haven't signed up yet, please grab a partner and uh, get involved in that one. August 30th, we have our chapter championship. That's going to be at South Hills, 36 holes. It's uh, an awesome day of golf at a great golf course. So please uh, sign up for that one as well. And then uh, finally, we have November 29th is our annual meeting. Uh, that's going to be a shamble, and it is held at Yorba Linda this year. So uh, if you haven't signed up for any of those, please get online, check the website, grab a partner, get signed up. And uh, lastly, we are still looking for some venues for 2022. So if anybody is willing to host or able to host, um, please reach out to me or Cameron. Uh, I know that uh, all of us will, will take your call. So if you're, if you're willing to host or able to host, then give me a call. Great, thanks so much, James, for jumping in for Joe there. Yep. All right, next up on the agenda is the section rep report. And uh, that's with me. So a couple quick things to go through, some education updates. Um, Gibbs is back and it's virtual. Uh, the next quarter of sessions um, is, is up. The next session is actually on the 27th. And the focus this time is driving top line revenue at your facility. So something that every single one of us can, uh, can benefit from. And uh, it's a great series. So jump on that if you, if you have some time. Uh, also, we have a launch. Our launch pad uh, is back. It's the, the program that helps our associates get through their level one book work. Awesome program. It's every Monday at 4 p.m. And lastly, uh, the annual California Teaching and Coaching Summit is back um, in October on the 18th and 19th at the Journey of Pechanga again. So I think that's open for registration now and jump online and get, get registered for that. I'm sure it will sell out. Uh, some upcoming events for the section. We have our section senior championship at PGA West, and that's August 23rd and 24th. Our section PGA professional championship at the Farms, September 13th through 15th. And lastly, uh, uh, the super fun event, the Pro Assistant Championship at a new venue, Journey of Pechanga, this year on September 27th and 28th. And finally, for my report, um, special awards is just about wrapped up. Selections will be submitted to the board August 19th for their approval, and we will uh, find out all the selected winners at that point. So that concludes my section rep report. Next, we have uh, coaching and player development updates by uh, Junko Harkins. She wasn't able to make the meeting, so she made a quick video. Unfortunately, we're having some technical difficulties with the loading the video. So Bryce ensured me he would 
email everybody on the meeting a, a link to that video so you can catch her updates uh, for coaching and player development. And to close out today, uh, I'd like to call on Jeff Johnson from our section staff to give a quick update on everything that's going on there. Jeff? Thanks, Cameron. Thanks very much. And hi to all. Um, initially, I wanted to share a few remarks from our new career consultant, Edwin Icke, um, as he was unable to be with us and asked that he have some of his message conveyed. Um, as you may know, Ed is a former member of our section uh, and has taken the reins that Ken Farrell uh, had assumed these past 10 years. Ken is now handling a larger territory uh, and Ed has become our section consultant and a brilliant one indeed. Uh, Ed's reported that he's been uh, able to visit all five chapters in the last three months and has attended multiple events and looking forward to you seeing his familiar face in the days and months ahead. Uh, as well, he wanted you to know that he's completed, uh, along with the CMAA, of which he's a member, a feature titled Power to Grow. This is a webinar that's available on YouTube, and he's hoping that you might dial in and take a look. Uh, Ed also wanted to report that there continues to be a steep decline in assistant and associate professionals uh, within our section, and of course the association as well. Uh, there are currently 60 listings on the PGA job board, and many are for entry level positions. He would like to remind everyone to update their profile online so that all may stay abreast of opportunities in the workplace and to please complete the compensation survey. I know these are things you hear annually, but uh, they are quite important. Uh, and he's reminding us that we are the third largest section in the country, but rank in the bottom 25% for participation. Uh, Ed reports the executive search arm of the career consulting um, department for 2021 has placed a director of golf at El Caballero. A search is currently in process for the general manager position at Riviera Country Club and a head golf professional position at Desert Horizons is coming very soon. He goes on to say that he's working with section staff on upcoming career service events, member to member messaging, updating the member benefit page and PGA ProFinder. Uh, Ed can be reached for those of you that have a pencil. Of course it's online, but it's E-W-I-N-I-E-C-K-I at PGA HQ.com. I promise he's a valuable resource. And I'll pause now if there are any questions on uh, Ed's brief report. So a few brief section notes. Our associate town hall program continues and is offered uh, the last Wednesday of each month. This is an opportunity for associates to share their experiences and more importantly, to have a voice uh, in those experiences. The next will be August 25th at 5 p.m. And a very special thanks to Tom Sun and John Kulo for their guidance in conducting this program. Uh, you will find the link to the town hall on the SCPGA website. As well, our Launchpad program restarted in 2021 for level one associates is conducted every Monday at 6 p.m. for an hour and it's simply to review level one materials and to assist our associates with their work experience. Uh, every week, there's a guest speaker who has just received his or her PGA membership. And please find that link on the SCPGA website as well. Uh, we conduct seven new member and associate orientations annually and the next is September the 2nd. These are virtual and are the requirement for playing in section and chapter events. If you are a new associate on this call or a newly elected member, please reach out so that we may get you on the schedule. Uh, these sessions usually last a mere hour and please 
contact me at the section office, although you'll likely receive a letter from me here in the next week or two about the schedule. Uh, and like our, excuse me, like our chapter, uh, or your chapter, I should say, the section has a very healthy balance sheet and continues to meet or exceed uh, its budget projections quarter over quarter, and happy to say uh, we've done so for the past six years. Our finance committee reviews uh, our portfolio on a bi-monthly basis, and Canterbury Consulting in Newport Beach, who's provided guidance for the section these past 11 years, continues to do an extraordinary job for all of us. And finally, as Cam mentioned, uh, our special awards recommendations will go to the Board of Directors on August the 19th for ratification, and announcements will be made shortly following. Uh, I'd like to personally thank uh, Metro members Jim Gormley, our chairman, uh, Bill Halbert, Andy Tooney, Cameron, and Rick Stiegel for their service on that committee, uh, and to Honorary President Tony Latendra for chairing our Hall of Fame and Honorary Life Member Committee. And finally, if there's anything you might need, you need only pick up the phone and we'll make it happen. I promise. Thanks to all. And thank you, Cameron. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. Tom, did you wanna jump on and say a couple things? Yeah, thanks, Cameron. Uh, appreciate that. And just a few things and, and following up, um, following up with Craig, uh, for one thing, I can't get my camera to work, which is to your benefit, I'm sure. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, following up with what uh, Craig had to mention, just do what you can to educate yourself on, on what golf is really doing out there, not, not only with COVID, uh, because we are leading the way and, and with all the upsurge uh, and, and where we have to be careful again and wearing our masks when necessary and when required uh, inside, indoors, uh, show the way as much as you can. Uh, we really appreciate that. That helped over the last year and a half. Uh, golf was really the, uh, the guide and the instigator for success uh, in uh, outdoor recreation, and, and uh, we all took a, a huge role in that. So let's, uh, let's keep it up uh, as, as long as we can and while we're uh, dealing with this upsurge in the pandemic. Uh, dealing with uh, the water issues and the environmental issues, uh, try to learn as much as you can about what we are doing out there, what water saving, what environmental saving efforts we are doing, uh, even outside of uh, of water conservation. Just a, a good example that I always like to use uh, this time of the year, especially when we're faced with so many wildfires, uh, is the, uh, the, the lakes on the golf courses that are made available to the firefighting agencies uh, to fight the fires. And, and you see it all the time and golf courses are being designed uh, and in some cases have to be designed uh, to store that water for firefighting. So anytime you have the opportunity to um, uh, educate yourself and expound and expand on that, uh, uh, which helps the game of golf and the business of golf, uh, please do so. Uh, as a follow-up to um, uh, our uh, PGA, uh, California and Nevada PGA chats, uh, we've moved those to once a month now. I think most of you know that. Uh, the next one uh, will be on August 20th. Uh, we're, we're trying to do the first Friday of each month, but due to travel and, and other things, uh, we are going to move the one in August to the 20th. So be aware of that. Those of you who uh, uh, really count on those chats as we do. Uh, to expand, uh, Cam brought up the California Teaching and Coaching Summit. Uh, it is presented by Travis Matthew. They're a, they're a huge supporter uh, of this event. Uh, and this is our fifth. That'll be it, uh, and it, it is at Pachanga on October 18th and 19th. I uh, urge you to take a look. The speaker lineup is uh, extraordinary again uh, this year, uh, brought to you by uh, Jamie and, and our uh, uh, teaching chair uh, and host of the, of the uh, summit, Randy Chang. We have Jim McLean and Derek Uyeda, uh, which will team up, and, and uh, that'll be uh, an exciting uh, duo to listen to, Dr. Brett McCabe. Uh, Marcus Potter on Potter's Putting, uh, Chris Mason, uh, 
a uh, Michael Breed. I think uh, many of you uh, know who Michael Breed is and may even listen to his radio show. Uh, and Melissa uh, Mo Martin, who is the Women's British o Open champion from 2012, I believe it was. Uh, we'll talk about her game and how uh, how straight she hit it in, in order hits hits it in order to survive. And then the keynote will be Brandel Chambly, and I think we'll all look forward to um, uh, to his keynote. Uh, I'll call it conversation, not really an, uh, an address, because Jamie. Uh, we'll do the uh, the moderating with that. So we're excited about that. And uh, well, I'd like to remind you also that, that previous uh, summits are on YouTube uh, and could be uh, viewed at any time, just like uh, the new series in October will be as well. Uh, so we look forward to that. One of our main strategies this year, and, and Cam, I'll, I'll be short. Uh, one of our main strategies this year is to enhance our communication and marketing. And we've worked with Saint Street Marketing, uh, just to give you an idea, just of a couple of things that we've established a, a consumer outreach program uh, that now our consumer database, which is gonna benefit all of us, uh, is up to 50,000 and, and uh, reaching towards 60,000. Uh, we hope to have uh, in the next six months or so uh, into the 100,000 uh, with our consumer outreach and our consumer database uh, that we run many of our programs now to uh, and expose and, and promote our PGA golf professional uh, with huge success. Just to give you an idea there, uh, we do these, uh, we do our featured coach emails uh, that do promote our section PGA coaches, uh, uh, PGA.com, our SCGA swing tips that we do with the SCGA. Uh, those all go through uh, the consumer database. And one of the, the measurements that we use uh, through this database uh, and, and other means of our communication, whether it's the socials we do, uh, such as Instagram, uh, we have over 1,500 leads that have been created. Uh, and so far, as it's been estimated that since November, uh, revenue generated for our SCPGA coaches and golf professionals uh, exceeds $250,000. Uh, that's a significant number, uh, and that shows how much of a, a benefit uh, proper communication and social outreach is. Uh, and congratulations to Bryce and his team, uh, our communications committee, and, and thanks to St. Street Marketing uh, for, for pulling us through and pushing us through uh, this, this new uh, communication program and, and, and consumer outreach. So we're really happy about that, and, and you'll see more of that as time goes on. Uh, thanks to, again, to the chapter for your support of Clubs for Youth. We're getting back in gear with Clubs for Youth now that we're, uh, well, we hope we will. Uh, we have program visits for uh, high schools in the area, uh, and uh, so we're looking forward to get back, uh, getting back involved with that. Uh, some of you, which ties into Clubs for Youth, might be aware of our Compton program, our City of Compton uh, and the high school program we have going there that was put on suspension due to COVID, but we have been working with the golf course superintendents of Southern California uh, in re, uh, redoing the golf course. Well, I should say uh, repreparing the golf course, uh, aeration of tees and greens. We're now going into a tree, a tree um, uh, maintenance program at the golf course. And there's many other things that we're gonna help the city of Compton with and hopefully in 22, get back into uh, programming for the high school students uh, in the city of Compton. We're, we're excited about that. Uh, one more thing, uh, our junior tour has been extremely busy, just like our tournament program, our member tournament program. Uh, with each event maximized, I think one thing with our junior tour that, that you've probably noticed this year is the uh, extreme success of our uh, alums. Uh, notwithstanding the recent gold medalist was Xander Shoffley uh, picking up the gold medal in, in Tokyo. Uh, and of course, the Open Championship winner, uh, Colin Murakawa. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, that's been uh, uh, well documented, Rick, uh, uh, his instructor. Uh, also, uh, the recent, most recent uh, USGA junior, uh, girls junior, excuse me, the girls junior PGA champion is also from Southern California. Anna Davis lives in San Diego. So we've been uh, hugely successful with our, uh, with our um, uh, 
uh, alums with our junior program. Uh, and congratulations to uh, our staff, uh, head by, uh, uh, headed, headed by Kevin Smith, uh, our junior golf director, and pushing out those activities and, uh, and, uh, and, and doing a really, really good job with, with the events uh, and the development of our youth players. So uh, that's kind of it, Cameron, uh, briefly. Sorry, I did go so quickly. Uh, our annual meeting also is at South Hills Country Club, just so you know, in December. Uh, so look for that, and, and we look forward to seeing you uh, at the next activity. So again, Cameron, thanks for having us. Uh, and as Jeff said, if you need anything, just don't hesitate to email us or call us, and we're here for you. So thanks. Great. Thanks, Jeff and Tom, for, for the updates on everything and all the support you've, uh, you've given us. Um, looks like we're pretty much ready to wrap things up. I don't see any comments or questions, but really quick. I did want to circle back to um, the Summer Pro Pro Scramble uh, next Monday here at my course. And I Hills just wanted to encourage everyone to, to come out and play. Course is in great shape. We, sh we shut it down for the entire morning so we can have a quick round and get around in, in a good amount of time. So do what you can to spread the word. We have a few more days left to, uh, to get registered. And we're just looking to, to fill it up and have a good time out here. So thanks to everybody. Uh, really looking forward to being back in person later this year, November 29th, our annual meeting and election and our, uh, our pro pro shamble that day. So uh, on behalf of, of the Metro chapter board, thanks so much for spending the last hour with us and have a great day. This meeting is adjourned. Thanks. Thanks, appreciate you being on. Thank you, Kim.